Michael Kosterlitz is the Harrison E. Farnsworth Professor of Physics at Brown University, fellow of the American Physical Society, Maxwell Medal and Prize from the British Institute of Physics, Lars Ansager Prize, and this year's Nobel Prize in Physics. And his topic is on topological yeah. defects and phase transitions. Please welcome Professor Kosterlitz. Okay, so this, this, this talk is basically a rehash of the talk I gave at the uh, Nobel, Nobel, when I accepted the Nobel Prize. And so it's more a story of, of how, uh, the, how I came to this, uh, uh, this, this costless Thales transition in two dimensions. You notice that the second name is Thales, who also was mentioned very much by Duncan. And so Thales is clearly the most important uh, character in this whole, uh, this whole subject. Now, the, so the subject of the talk is topological defects and phase transition in two dimensions. And the way I came to this is a bit peculiar because um, I was a, a, high, a, a high energy physicist who'd done some complicated calculations for essentially no return. And so I ended up um, having failed to get into CERN where I wanted to go to continue high energy physics. I ended up in Birmingham University, which is the last place I wanted to be at that time. However, uh, it was the best thing that could have happened because there I met David Thaulis. And I had this, uh, ended up in David's office listening to him talking about all sorts of weird and wonderful things that I hadn't, knew absolutely nothing about, things like vortices, phase transitions, um, topology, and so on and so forth. And so after a bit, I realized I hadn't understood anything he'd said. So I, I sort of took my courage in my hands and said, uh, sorry, David, I'll have to stop you. I haven't understood anything. Could you please explain to me where the first equation you wrote down on the board came from? And he said, oh, didn't I tell you that? And I said, no, you didn't. So he proceeded to give me a very clear exposition of what was going on. And from that point on, I decided that every time I didn't understand him, which was off frequent, uh, I would assume that's because he hadn't explained things properly. So after that, we actually got on very well. And he asked me about, to, to, if I could, told me about this problem in two dimensions, but this is a long-standing problem about phase transitions in two dimensions. See, in the early 70s, the situation really was as follows. There was a Hamiltonian for the you know, nearest neighbor exchange for ferromagnet, and the uh, question was, are there any phase transitions there? Well, we knew that, of course, the, uh, the two-dimensional Ising model had a well-known solution that was uh, solved by Onsager way back when. And this series of models depended on the number of components of the spin. And so if you look at you know, n equals 2 situation, is, is, uh, could be mapped into a superfluid film of superfluid helium-4. And in that case, well, there were some simulations done by um, Gene Stanley, and they were very ambiguous, of course, but there was a hint that maybe there was actually a phase transition there from a disordered, standard disordered state, high temperatures, to an ordered state, at low temperatures. And then uh, for the two-dimensional Heisenberg model, the three-component spin, and uh, generalizations four-component, the answer was probably not. That was more numerical uh, simulation due to Gene Stanley. However, there was an exact solution for the, if you take the number of spin components to infinity, that's the spherical model, and uh, definitely there was no phase transition there. So this situation, as far as you know, we were concerned, this was a neat theoretical problem. This needed some more investigation.
Now, of course, there was some experimental evidence for the, uh, in these n equals two case, and this was a, 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 a figure from a paper by Chester Yang and Stevens uh, from a, an experiment they did in the late 60s, early 70s, but published in 1972. And the data there shows clearly that this is a two-dimensional uh, film of helium, helium-4, at low temperatures. Now, the, the, the bottom um, uh, um, uh, is basically just, how does this thing work? OK, thank you. OK, this is better. This is simpler. Yes, the bottom is basically just the, the coverage of helium, the amount of helium absorbed on the surface of a resonant crystal. And of course, it's a very thin film. So as, as the crystal is vibrating, if it's a normal fluid, you'd expect that all the fluid is stuck to the crystal and vibrating with it. And so the, mass of, the effective mass of the crystal would simply increase, and the resonant frequency would go down. And so the, devia the, the, resonant the deviation of the resonant frequency is plotted on the vertical axis. And we notice that here, it follows exactly the expected, expected straight line for the uh, resonant frequency as a function of the coverage. But at this point here, suddenly, um, it looks very much as if a certain fraction of the, of the film, of the helium film, is decoupled from the surface of this vi resonant vibrating crystal. And the only way one can explain this discrepancy is to say, OK, at least part of the flu adsorbed fluid has is superfluid, in other words, decoupled from the crystal. So this was the main experimental evidence we had for believing that in the two-dimensional um, planar rotor model or two-dimensional uh, um, XY magnet or whatever you want to call it, that there is a phase transition at some finite, well, this would basically be finite temperature. Now, so the question is, what's going on here? Because remember, there, there is a rigorous theorems floating around which said that in this system, in such a system, there is no long range order. Now, there's no magnetization at any finite temperature. And of course, because all we knew about phase transitions in those days was really due to Lev Landau, who said that uh, phase transition uh, signals the onset of long-range order. In other words, in the system, it would be magnetization. But rigorous theorems say there's no magnetization at any finite temperature. Therefore, the natural um, implication, early 70s, remember, when nobody knew anything, was that there's no phase transition in such a system. But there were the numerical simulations, by, especially by Gene Stanley, which indicated that something might be going on in such a system. And there was this experiment here on helium films, which said, look, there's obviously a transition. Here's the discrepancy of the amount of fluid decoupled from the surface of the vibrating crystal. Therefore, there must be a transition. But this transition, if you lower the temperature, was clearly to a state with no magnetization because the rigorous theorem said there's no long range order. So then this was, so this was the puzzle facing us. And Thaulis, who knew everything about everything, um, simply said, OK, there's a problem here which, should be so, which we should think about. Me, coming from a, a background of strong ignorance, I didn't even know there was a problem here. So I had no difficulty with this either. So we went and thought about it a little bit, or should I say quite a bit. And we, we sort of basically set up the model. And here, is, we said, OK, let, there's a spin on each site. This is purely classical now, because uh, for me, 
quantum at the time, quantum mechanics was some, I right, knew a little bit of quantum mechanics, but it, it simply was an unnecessary complication on, on the real physics. Of course, these days, uh, as Duncan explained, it, uh, quantum mechanics can be more than slightly important, and of course, David Thales knew this. Oh, by the way, you may, I don't know if you know this, but the, it was interesting, because the three, you know, the Nobel uh, Committee, the Nobel Prize can be awarded to a maximum of three people in any one year. But, there were, it was awarded for two pieces of work, both of which sort of involved topology in some sense. So there were, and there were two people involved in each piece of work. So it looks as if there were four people um, involved here, which was one too many. But, and so, the, so what the Nobel Committee did was they said, all right, we'll give a, an equal amount of the prize to each person, but one person from each pair involved in the two pieces of work was the same person, Thaulus. So the, everything was satisfied by, by dividing the, the prize uh, half to Thaulus and split the other half equally between Duncan and myself which might have upset some people, but actually when you think about it for a moment, it's, it's very fair and it solved the, the Nobel Committee's uh, dilemma beautifully. Now, so this was, the pro this, was the, this was the, this is about the only piece of mathematics I'm going to show. So, we've got a spin which can, is a two, uh, can be parameterized by the angle it makes with some random axis. So it's two component spin. So we can write this as a, so re, re, rewrite it in terms of a complex order parameter, magnitude times e to the i theta. But of course, this is invariant under this angle, which is the angle the spin makes with some axis, as theta goes to theta plus some multiple of two pi. And this is basically the sole content of the topology in this system. And this is rather fortunate because at the time, I wouldn't have known a piece of topology if it sat unbarked. So I was lucky that, uh, that, that the topology so, in this system is so simple that uh, even I could deal with it. And of course, if you take the inter integrate the phase around some closed contour, any arbitrary closed contour, it has to be a multiple of two pi. And so that, that's the sole uh, content of topology. Now, and these, um, when the uh, angle, when you walk around the system by, uh, it changes by, by, by 2 pi, then this is a, you call this excitation a vortex because uh, if you take a superfluid film which flows and the, the, the fluid goes round and round some point, uh, this, is, this, is a, this is basically a vortex. And of course, the center of the vortex uh, is no longer superfluid because there the fluid, the velocity of fluid goes like one over the distance from the center. And when you close the center, uh, there's clearly too big, the speed is too big and therefore the fluid has to be normal. So you've got a piece of normal fluid in the center of each vortex. And the manifold in which everything's defined now is just the rest of the the rest of the system, so you've got a system uh, with, a, with, a, with a number of holes, and when the, the fluid circulating around the hole um, is, is your topological excitation. And so the energy of, in a system of size L, A is a, some microscopic length scale, which is say the or size of the vortex core or something like that, is this of order pi times J, the, the uh, uh, exchange constant times the logarithm of the system size. And, of course, the entropy of such an excitation is just proportional to the logarithm of the number of positions it has, can have, and the system size L, the number of positions it can have, is L over A all squared. Therefore, the entropy of such an object is just, is just this. And so then you figure out the free energy of such a system, elementary statistical mechanics, and uh, the probability of get, having such an excitation proportional to the 
e to the minus beta, sort of a temperature, times this free energy, which is of order L of ray, some number to the minus pi k minus two, where k is, a, is the interaction constant divided by temperature. So it's, it's the appropriate uh, uh, um, um, quantity. And so, this, as the system size goes to infinity, this is zero if pi k is greater than two, in other words, at high temperatures, or it's one, it, because it's normalized, it's one if pi k is less than two. And so, what this means is that the probability of finding a, a, an isolated vortex at low temperatures is zero, whereas the probability of finding a vortex at high temperatures, uh, with pi k less than two, is it basically is one, and therefore, um, at high temperatures, you're going, the, the number of vortices is going to proliferate, and uh, if you've got a lot of these uh, vortices floating around your system, it's clearly a disordered system. Therefore, to investigate a phase transition in such a system, we you will know, have to look at the statistical mechanics of a collection of, of vortices. Oh, okay. The, David basically had constructed this argument about uh, um, the absence of a phase transition in a two-dimensional Heisenberg model, that's n equals three model. And, you know, the spin you can parameterize by two, two angles, the azimuthal angle phi and the polar angle theta. And topology tells you there's one topological invariant, which has to be, this n has to be an integer. And here is your topological invariant. So if you, you can figure this thing out. Imagine uh, you have a, a, a configuration uh, in th of the spins in three dimensions, then, okay, the, sorry, this invariant is of no consequence in two-dimensional statistical mechanics in this case because the, there's no energy barrier between different topological sectors, which implies that there's no ordered state for the two-dimensional uh, Heisenberg magnet, uh, which is... Uh, also agrees with the Merman-Wagner theorem, which is nice. So that, in other words, the Merman-Wagner theorem in 1966, that was a rigorous theorem which said there's no long range order. But, uh, so for the, for the two-dimensional Heisenberg model, that's great, and basically nothing has any effect. But for the, for the, two, for the n equals two model, superfluid helium film, uh, the the, 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 the rigorous theorem is Merman-Wagner theorem, still abate, there's no long range order, but the phase transition is determined by these topological excitations. And here is a little picture, I mean, it's a very, very, very schematic picture of a vortex uh, circulating in the uh, clockwise direction. So we can call this and n equals, you know, a vortex with uh, a unit charge, vo unit, with unit uh, circulation, or an n equals one vortex. An n equals minus one vortex is, of course, just the thing circulating the other way. And so the question is, as the statistical mechanics of a collection of, of these vortices. Now, you can ask the question, okay, why, is this, why does this matter? Well, the simplest example is in a, a superfluid film. Suppose we've got a superfluid film between these two uh, boundaries or alternatively on a, say, a rod, and these two boundaries mean the, you, you've gone right around the system. And suppose there's a uniform superfluid flow going, let's say, this direction. 
Now we stick a couple of vortices in. This plus means a, a, a vortex with a unit circulation, one, one unit of circulation, and this one means a vortex with a, a unit of circulation in the other direction. Now, it's easy to see, now well, not so easy, that there's a, this force, this flow of the, of the, of the background superfluid velocity imposes a, a, a force on this vortex that moves it towards this boundary, and this vortex moves it to this boundary. So eventually, these two vortices simply uh, will just either go right around the system and recombine, or go at the edges and disappear. And this will reduce the flow by a small factor. It's the Planck's constant divided by uh, the mass of helium atom times, uh, times the width of the system. Now, if you can get, if the, if the system is such that you produce these pairs of vortices, then the flow will simply unbind them. And this, and of course, once the, the superfluid flow is, um, is dissipated, you, that's no longer a superfluid. That's a normal fluid. Therefore, the whole question of whether you, whether you have a superfluid or a normal fluid depends on the statistical mechanics of these vortices. And so, uh, for obviously, the first thing to do, or the easiest thing to do, is work out the equilibrium statistical mechanics of a collection of vortices. So, oops, sorry, going the wrong direction. So we did that, and on the way, we constructed a renormalization group uh, due to following uh, the, the, the treatment due to Phil Anderson and Gideon Duval back in, when was that, uh, 1970 or so, who had done it for the, the condo problem. And this can be regarded as a one-dimensional, one over R squared Ising system. And they'd, they'd, they'd construct this elaborate normalization group transformation for this system. Of course, they, they called it a scaling method because at the time, a renormalization group wasn't known. Wilson hadn't really appeared yet. And so, but I sort of thought, well, now the, the essential thing is, or David and I thought, the essential thing about the excitations is that they interact logarithmically with each other. In other words, they're like a set of points, uh, charges in two dimensions. And then, of course, you think to yourself, now, wait a minute. We're to, in the condo problem, we're talking about a one-dimensional system, or, a one, or if it's an Ising model with a one over R squared interaction in one dimension, then the system can be parameterized by a set of kinks, right? So you start with spin one, then spin reverses, goes a bit further along, you get a, um, another domain wall, and so on. So you can parameterize in terms of the positions of these domain walls with alternating sides. So the line, and so we thought, oh, well, obviously we're looking for point um, excitations interacting logarithmically, because we understood the one, the one dimensional system. And so then we knew of these excitations in two dimensions, which also did the same thing. But we omitted, we didn't realize that there was a big difference between one and two dimensions. However, in two dimensions, we, what we ended up with, I, 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 this is the essence of the theory. This K is a, is, is a parameter, which is one over temperature, basically the interaction between vortices. It's, and this, uh, this Y is the fugacity of a vortex. It's basically just related to the energy of the vortex core. It, now, it's an approximate, so it's a very approximate description of the system. And we, and I, because I didn't know that, uh, because you get approximate theory, of course you can't get, you only get approximate results, but anyway, I went ahead and managed to derive these weird equations, assuming 
that the vortex for gas is exceed, extremely small. In other words, a very dilute system of vortices. Now, the only thing I had to, we had to impose was overall neutrality. In other words, the total vorticity of the whole system is zero. Because if it, the vortic, vorticity of the whole system was uh, finite, that would uh, up, require infinite energy that diverged logarithmically, uh, which we assumed uh, was large enough that we couldn't have it. And so, and this L simply re represents um, the scaling parameter. Uh, you know, you'd simply increase the cutoff from some small length scale how to do for time. Time's over. Sorry about that. All right, let me just show one more slide. The results look like this. And, oops, gone the wrong way. Okay. Okay. Here is the experimental uh, 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 plot due to John Reppy. This is the superfluid density times some appropriate set of units as a function of TC, the critical, the, uh, critical temperature. And the predictions of our theory are this straight line here. In other words, uh, the, on, the, the, the superfluid density just below TC is a finite number. And as a function of TC, it follows this straight line. There's a parameter of free fit, believe it or not. Uh, this, and so, and this is, these are the various experimental points from a set of experiments um, due to Dave, John Reppy and um, his co-workers and various third sound measurements. And those points fit rather well to our theoretical parameter-free prediction. In fact, this fits amazingly well. And so I think one has to regard this as a verification um, of, of, of the theory. The same sort of thing can be done for a two-dimensional solid, which I don't have time to talk about. But we have the same sort of topological excitations there, dislocations and disclinations. And the fit from, between theory and experiment is, is as good, if not better, than this. So, now, this work is not as impressive and uh, in, probably important as the work by Duncan Haldane on uh, topological insulators and so on, quantum mechanical effects, but the work that Dave and I did was really the first uh, work, the first time at the topological excitations were, were, this were used uh, to, 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 to describe statistical mechanics. And so um, I personally don't know of any more applications to, uh, of the sort of thing we did to the future, but certainly in quantum mechanical systems, things are just starting, as Duncan said. Now, I hope you learned something from this. Uh, the, the reason, the, 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 the sort of work that we did, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Kostelitz. Uh, do we have questions for, yes, question here? Please. I have a naive question about uh, the free, free energy of the vortex part. Uh, so as you have shown, the free energy is uh, a scaling like a log of systems, uh, log of the linear system size. So typically we would expect that there is a linear term uh, in the free energy, I mean linear in system size. Uh, in what, condition, in what condition do we expect that, that term vanishes? Okay, the, the, uh, the, the, the Hamiltonian for this system is exactly that of a two-dimensional two um, electrostatic uh, Hamiltonian for a point set of charges. And if you look at the total energy, it's exactly like that with the logarithmic interaction plus a term 
which diverges um, as the log of the system size, except the coefficient is the sum of the total number of uh, um, charges all squared. So it only this, this infinite energy only vanishes if it's a neutral system. In other words, there are many minus one vortices as plus one vortices. I see. Okay. Right. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Hall. Pro <laughs> Professor Kostlitz. So let's move uh, to our next. Um